Housing and Urban Development began in the in the Link, Lyndon Johnson administration, the Great Society, and it was just rife with problems from the very beginning. And so, it's no small feat to come in and out of there and uh, uh, raise uh, your profile enough to go into higher office. We had uh, uh, people like Jack Kemp, who were secretaries of HUD, and he attempted to become uh, vice president and didn't make it. And the story is long between people who didn't make it to a higher office or who actually ended up going south. So let me just say I'm, I'm glad to be uh, done with that assignment and uh, very grateful to the president for the honor he gave me to do it. But I am enjoying and loving my work in the United States Senate, and I'm uh, uh, really finding it to be uh, uh, tremendously interesting, enjoyable. Uh, is uh, such a varied uh, scenery that you have each and every day, and the responsibilities are immense. And so uh, first thing I'd like to say is that as tough as it was to campaign, as tough as it was to, to go through the gauntlet of a tough election, I am delighted to have, have done it and to have the opportunity to represent you as your United States Senator. First of all, let me say that I, um, and, and Lou wanted me to reminisce a little bit about my campaign, which I think is important. It kind of sets the stage. I'm probably the newest uh, uh, artifact that you could have here to study as uh, students of politics. Uh, let me just remind you a little bit of the history of the last year. I uh, came back to Florida on December the 19th with the intention of running for the United States Senate. I announced my campaign on January 4th or 5th or something like that and began the process of assembling a staff. See, I, I wasn't in the Congress already, so I didn't have a ready-made staff that could just transfer, leave their government jobs, now become a campaign staff. That's a hugely important part of a campaign, hiring a good staff, uh, having people you've known for a long time. I didn't have that luxury. I was dealing with people that I really hadn't known very long. And I wasn't dealing with the staff that I had grown up with or been accustomed to. So it was, it was people getting used to people, and it was uh, a tough, uh, tough at times. But in order to begin to raise money to run a campaign, you've got to have a staff. You've got to have an organization. You've got to do the simple things, like printing the invitations to invite people to a fundraiser, talking some good-hearted person like Lou or whoever to open their home or their uh, organization to host an event for you. All of that takes time. Suffice it to say that my first fundraiser was February the 5th. Now that is about a month later. And it really was composed of mostly friends, people who know me in the community, people who I'd grown up with, Cuban Americans in Orlando who were very proud of the fact that I might rise to this position. And all of a sudden, uh, they came together and said, we want to do our first fundraiser for you. We raised like $100,000 that night, which was a wonderful beginning. But that was only the down payment. It was only the very beginning of what turned out to be an effort that raised over $12 million, over $5 million in the primary alone. Most of that money, of course, is devoted to television dollars. You know, statistics show that McCain-Feingold was supposed to fix the process. And by the way, that $12 million that I raised was not all that was spent on my race. My opponent and I both had help from other sources. Uh, my opponent in the general election probably had a little more help than I did because I was consistently being outspent. Uh, groups like Emily's List and... Uh, whatever the other groups were. I don't even remember their names now, but that one does stick to mind. In my side, it was mostly the Republican Party campaign committee, and millions more dollars were added to the expenditures that were spent on that race. But let me say that uh, McCain-Feingold, which came into being in, in, in 2004, was supposed to impact that cycle, uh, well intended as it was, and there's been a lot of debate in Congress you know, over the years about the need for something to constrain this system and I know that uh, part of, of our effort here is to talk about how we might make it better for the future. One thing I would say is campaigns in America are too long. We need to shorten the time in which we campaign. Now, I did it in nine months. That's about as short a time frame as you can do it and become known in a state like Florida. I had never campaigned statewide in this state. Lou, who did it a couple of times, can tell you it is a difficult and daunting task. We have a state of 17 million people. But beyond that, we have a state that is filled with a diversity that the student body of UCF represents. We have a student body here that I know is a microcosm of our state. We have a state that in South Florida is more akin to Latin America than it is to the rest of America. We have a state that in parts of South Florida is uh, a largely a Jewish population. We move along the state into the middle part of the state and then we have the I-4 corridor, that famous I-4 corridor where we obviously have tremendous growing population, we have more suburban growth, and we have a combination of 
of, of ethnic mix. We then move along into the middle northern part of the state and the panhandle, and of course that's really more like South Florida, I mean not South Alabama and South Georgia, and the, the commonality with South Florida really is very little. So we would really campaign in three different states, and 17 million people, it's impossible to reach them one by one. As in, well intended as campaigns might be to get the candidate out and meet people on a one-to-one -one basis, to do events that might gather a group as large as this one is here today, that is not but a little pebble of sand on a beach of, uh, of, of who you need to touch. 17 million people can only be reached through mass media. So therefore, where does the money go? Why do you have to have so much money? for media advertising. You gotta have the money in order to get your message out, in order for people to get to know who you are, and for you to be able to then translate that into support for your campaign and ultimately votes on election day. So ultimately, our budget for our campaign, and uh, you know, essentially how you do it, or how we did it, is that we begin and decide what is the TV budget that we must have? How much television advertising do we have to do? And obviously you have expensive and highly paid consultants to help you in that decision. Uh, in addition to, ha to that, you have also polling that you must do. Uh, another big expense is the issue of tracking, which in the last days of a campaign you do if you have the money. And when you track, you can follow the progress of your advertising by region, by media market, by demographics and then you can sort of fine-tune and adjust your advertising pitch. You're spending millions, so you might as well know that what you're spending is having the desired effect of what you were hoping it would accomplish. So you decide how much your TV budget must be, and that is sacrosanct. You've got to have that or you won't make it. And once you decide in your TV budget, everything else has to adjust. So you have a payroll for staff. You have, in addition to that, of course, a postage for mailings. Uh, and, and uh, other ways of reaching voters other than television and radio. You do uh, earn media, which is essentially trying to get for free what otherwise you would pay for, do an, uh, an event. Uh, you know, Bob Graham was immensely successful. Senator Graham, my predecessor in this particular seat of Congress, um, in, in his work days. Well, that was a wonderful way to get attention. He did it during his campaign, and then he followed it later. Uh, so gimmicks like that, I didn't have a gimmick anywhere near that good. Uh, but I uh, essentially, you go out and you try to create events that will create interest, that will be covered by the media, and will give you an opportunity for exposure to make a point to talk about an issue. And, and, and that actually is uh, an adjunct and correlating to the other. So McCain-Feingold was supposed to fix this. And what happened? Well, instead of spending $3 billion in campaigns for the presidency and the Congress, after McCain-Feingold, which was supposed to fix the problem, we spent $4 billion. And so, in fact, what was supposed to work and ameliorate the effect of money in politics didn't have that effect at all. What did it have? Well, it had a very, I think, negative effect, which is the emergence of 527s. And in that we saw, of course, the more famous ones in the presidential campaign, which, uh, uh, you know, the, the McCain-Feingold essentially took soft money dollars away from the political parties and essentially said you cannot spend soft money. Soft money is a campaign money that parties just raised in wholesale. People could give to it uh, large donations. So now organizations emerge that could collect large donations of money. We have, uh, uh, you know, uh, the most famous of these 527s, the Swift Boat Veterans uh, and America Coming Together. Both of those entities, uh, America Coming Together, spend vastly many more millions than Swift Boat Veterans did, but Swift Boat Veterans, I think, probably were largely more effective. Uh, so what do we do in the future? As we took, look to the future, I as a new senator, the Congress, how do we fix this broken down system? It should not be this expensive. It should not be this difficult. And, and, uh, and I'll talk a minute about what I think the consequences of having this focus on money are, is that we have to do something to improve the system. We have to change the system. George Soros, one individual, contributed $24 million to various anti-George Bush groups in order to, uh, to defeat the president. He didn't succeed, but nonetheless, is it fair that one person by himself could put $24 million into the process? That's not what the 527 system was supposed to do away with. There were others who may have put millions of dollars into it. That, again, is not something that is particularly helpful. What I think we need to do is to look at the impact of politics, to look at the impact of how we can 
lessen that impact because here's the, the, pro the problem we face. In my nine months of campaigning, guess what the number one priority of my campaign staff was as they were scheduling my time? You guessed it, raising money. So whenever we were doing a money event, then we would try to tailor other events associated with it. In the last days of the campaign, because of the hurricane season that we had, which was historic, as you recall, and because of the problems associated with the hurricanes, which lasted really a period of about six weeks and began right before the general election and worked their way right into the middle of the general election, essentially kept us from raising money for a period of time. I had a fundraiser in Jacksonville where Vice President Cheney was to be the headliner. We had a guaranteed half a million dollars that we were going to raise that day. It was at a critical point in the general election campaign because I had just come through the primary, had spent every single dime of money that I had. My general election opponent didn't have that tough a primary, didn't have to spend all of her money in the primary, so had some, a little bit of a nest egg. I didn't. And that fundraiser had to be canceled. So what happened was that it pushed fundraising further into the political season, and even on the last days of the campaign, I was having to raise money. My opponent was having to raise money. The media that was covering the campaign were frustrated because we didn't have events other than money-raising events. We weren't meeting voters. And by the way, if you ask me what would be more enjoyable, meeting voters or fundraising, I guarantee you is meeting voters. Getting on the phone and asking strangers for money, there's nothing fun about that. There's nothing pleasant about that constant pressure cooker of raising money. I'm very grateful for the people who helped me. I think, frankly, without the incredible support that I got from uh, an awful lot of friends, but also from the Cuban-American community, that I might not have succeeded. But I think in the end of the day, at the end of the day, that we have to recognize that there is an unhealthy, unhealthy balance here between the time a candidate can spend on voter contact, on one-on-one -on -one with the voters, and the amount of money that must be devoted necessarily to uh, raising the money that it takes to finance a high-power statewide campaign in a state like Florida. You know, I talked to some of my Senate colleagues, and they're from, from smaller states. For instance, uh, Joe Biden, fairly well-known senator. You probably, if you've watched Meet the Press, you've seen Joe Biden because he's a regular feature of programs like Meet the Press. Joe Biden is a senator from Delaware. And when he runs for office, he runs in an area and has to speak to voters that are less than what I did when I ran for Orange County Chairman. When I ran for Orange County Mayor, I was talking to 850,000 people. We still had to raise a decent amount of money. We still had to do it on TV and radio. But I was able to get out and talk to voters. I remember being out here a couple of times just to talk to young students about getting involved in the process, helping me in my campaign, recruiting volunteers. That kind of thing can happen in Delaware. It can happen in New Hampshire. It can happen in Rhode Island, which I think is smaller yet than Delaware. It can't happen in Florida with 17 million people. So we're destined to be a state that is going to be media-dominated, that is going to be money-dominated, and a state in which, frankly, uh, we, we have to continue to work at ameliorating the impact of money on politics so that the person running for office can have that, that wonderful democratic American thing, which is the town hall meeting, the conversation with voters, the relaxed fashion in which people would like to meet their future representatives, whether it be in a coffee at somebody's home or, or things like that. I remember the most fun I had in my campaign for county chairman. I don't think I had any fun in the campaign for Senate. But anyway, uh, the most fun I think I had in my campaign for county chair, county mayor now, is that we decided to do these coffees. And remember, Lou, we, they were immensely successful. We had a video, uh, which we had in this campaign as well, which told a little bit about me and my life and my campaign and my ideas. And, and we would uh, go into people's homes, friends who would agree to open their homes, sometimes old friends, sometimes new friends. And we would invite 25, 30, 40 people. We'd show the video and then they'd have dessert or coffee or whatever. And it was a chance to just in a group of 30 people to get to know folks or folks to get to know me. You could hear the issues that were of concern. I didn't need a poll. I had a pulse. I could tell uh, what people were interested in. But you fast forward to this past election, and there are big events. There are events with thousands or hundreds of people. It's very difficult to get to know folks. It's very difficult to get on that one-on-one -on -one basis. And so, um, you know, I think ultimately it, it is a much healthier approach to have that opportunity for the more relaxed voter contact. Uh, one last issue I'll touch on is uh, uh, there, there, the, 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 by, uh, well, and let me take some questions at the end of this. I hope that would be yes, part of what you want to do. 
There are groups that, uh, whose sole purpose is to, uh, to, to raise money and to uh, be a part of the process. And that's part of America, by the way. And when, when the dean was talking about a collision of interests, we have that wonderful freedom of speech that we speak of and we're so proud of and, and ought to be always a part of, obviously, of politics and part of our daily lives. And, and when that freedom of speech is impinged upon by issues like curtailing campaign uh, donations, uh, that becomes a real serious problem. But whether it be labor unions who, frankly, in my view, uh, raise money in a way that's uh, very different than other organizations as part of the dues, uh, a member of the union can't really say, I don't want to donate to the political part of this organization, they pretty much do, or whether it is uh, business groups that band together and form a PAC, a political action committee, uh, or simply a 527. These are ancillary groups. And the thing that I hated when I was attacked by 527s, and I was attacked by them in the primary and then later in the general election, is that these are groups that are left field. Not so much the PACs, but on the 527s. You don't know who they are. You don't know who's donating to them. You don't know why they're organized or how long they've existed. They just appear and they attack and they do, uh, frankly, what is typically the hatchet job that the candidate doesn't want to have to do. And so what they do is two things. They're a secret group that you don't know who it is and that the public has no idea who is influencing them or it or what their purposes are. And the second part of it is, is that they tend by their very nature to be the most irresponsible when it comes to negative advertising. And so I think that combination makes 527s a real good candidate for extension. I would love to transfer that soft money back to the parties and let the Democrats and Republicans advertise and be accountable for what they put on the air rather than 527s in their anonymity, can be out there lurking in the background, not really telling you who they are or why they're involved, and at the end of the day, uh, doing probably the, the, the toughest hatchet job of any of the organizations. So with that, let me um, throw it open for some questions. I'd like to ask you uh, about the 527s, and if you think that with the current attitude in Congress, whether it would be possible to pass legislation that would restrict them for before the 2006 elections, or if not before the 2008 elections, and how you would see that happening, and what type of restrictions we could pass to uh, fix this problem of these organizations that have sprung well, up. Um, it's not on the urgent agenda, let me put it that way to you. I've, I've heard a certain consensus that, that this ought to be done. Uh, I don't think anybody likes them, you know, in the political process. I mean, I think they're viewed uh, as having not been what was intended by McCain-Feingold and we should fix it. There may be a consensus to fix it. The problem is going to come on how and, and to what extent and in, in what ways. But I think they should be regulated. I think they should come into the Federal Elections Commission. They should have to report. They should have to disclose. At a very minimum, that should happen. When I say it's not on the urgent agenda, at least from the Senate side, and Congressman Feeney is here, he might speak from the House perspective, but we've got an, a, a short-term agenda that we're pursuing, and essentially uh, we've been fortunate and, and have worked diligently to do what the House always encourages the Senate to do, which is to get something done. And amazingly enough, this Senate is getting something done. We passed out class action reform. We passed a bankruptcy bill that had been kicking around for eight years. And uh, we're moving it all along to uh, do a couple of other things that have been pending. Uh, whether or not it's something that will come about towards the latter part of this year, uh, remains to be seen. But I, for one, would be very supportive. Having lived through the process, I believe it would be very healthy for us to, to change that process and allow for something different than the 527s, the way they operated in the last election cycle. Senator Martinez, I can understand why it might be questionable to accept funds and donations from labor unions and such, but shouldn't a private citizen have the right to donate money that he or she has earned himself and to spend the money how they would choose to? Well, I think it's unfair to, uh, let me put it this way, the attempts to limit the amount of campaign contributions only ensures that the candidate will spend more time raising the money because it is a game. You can only raise uh, so much money per individual, per cycle, uh, families can't give more and all of that. So all that does is limits the per capita contributions, which means that you've got to do more events with more people jump through more hoops, have more people that are raising money for you. At the end of the day, I'm not sure it diminishes the influence of any individual that much. And so while it's counterintuitive to the way we've gone in the past, which is to restrict the amount of donations, I think, frankly, that at the end of the day, we would be able to spend more time in voter contact and campaigning other than money raising if the limits were 
extended upwardly. And so I'm not sure that uh, the $2,000 limit is really a wise way to go. If you raise the money off from one individual, though, wouldn't that leave more time for what you said you enjoy more, such as no, going absolutely. to different I, I agree with that. ideas and events? I, I agree with you. The, the balance has to be there, though, because it would be sort of terrible if all of a sudden George Soros was the only source of the funding. Now, it would be terrible in many ways, I think, frankly, because I think his ideas are a little out there. But, but beyond that, I think that, that, that it would just be too beholden to one individual. So there must be some framework to work within. But I'm not so sure that $2,000 really is, is the limit. And the truth is, when you're raising millions of dollars, the influence of someone who may have donated $10,000 to your campaign really is not that great. I mean, it's just not that great. And that's, by the way, a misperception that I think exists with the public, which is that somehow people who write the checks somehow have their claws into the people in public life. And I'll never dispel that perception by telling you that I feel otherwise, but I can remember when I ran for county mayor that uh, I, was, I raised money from developers because obviously that's what's interested in county government. And that it was written that I would then not be able to regulate growth and that I would just now be beholden to, to the developers. The fact of the matter is that after I was elected, I did one of the most far-reaching growth management things that has been done in the state, which is uh, now called the Martinez Plan, you know, which is about growth in schools. And some people like it, some people don't. It's got all kinds of different interpretations. The bottom line is that I was independent of those who given to me uh, uh, to act as I saw fit and with integrity. And I think most people in public life intend to live that way, intend to lead their lives that way. And, and I think, frankly, that the perception of influence is more heightened than I think in reality it is. The gentleman mentioned about the Terry Schiavo bill. Much of Congress raced back to uh, Washington, the President flew in special, and the law was passed, but it doesn't seem to have done anything. What was intended to happen, and why have the judges ruled against the well, bill that was passed? It's an excellent question, and I'm frankly not anxious to continue to delve on an issue that's so difficult for so many people, but I'm glad you asked that question, and I think it deserves an answer. First of all, let me say that uh, the Congress acted on this bill in a way that we thought would be uh, constrained in its effect, not applied to unintended things. This, this is an action that was taken by the Congress in a very short time frame. It jumped through the hoops of committees. It didn't go through the committee process. And so the intent was to make sure that we made a bill that was a law that was so ter narrowly tailored that it would have an impact of having a review by the judiciary and the federal system of the Chiavo case without opening a Pandora's box that we had not intended to open. The second thing we did, and the very clear intent of the bill, was that we gave jurisdiction to the federal court to look at it. Now the Congress, for those who believe that this was out of bounds and so forth and so on, uh, they need to understand the role of the federal courts. The federal courts derive all of their jurisdiction from the United States Congress. They have the power to do absolutely nothing by the Constitution or by their birthright. They are creatures of the Congress and their jurisdiction is specifically delineated by the Congress. So the Congress can tell a court, the federal court, what they have jurisdiction over and what they don't. And in this instance we said, you will take jurisdiction of this case. We also told them that the parents will have standing, meaning the parents can bring an action another issue that could have prevented the parents from bringing the action. In addition to that, we said, and we want you to do a review de novo. That's a Latin phrase that to lawyers like myself means anew, all over again. And it means that the judge would then have the responsibility, uh, the intent was, to look at the facts again. Now, people say there have been 19 judges who have looked at this case. The fact is only one, case, one judge has looked, even as of this day, at the facts of the case, and that, that is the circuit court, ju court judge. So our intent was that there would be a second review. There would be a federal look, just like we would do for a death penalty person. In other words, what was happening here is that we have a person who, by an order of a state judge, was going to die. And there was a family dispute about it. And so we thought it would be appropriate to have the federal judiciary look at it. This was not a political issue. This had bipartisan support. There was support from uh, people on both sides of the aisle. There was support from liberals and, and conservatives. You know, I work very closely in passing the bill in the Senate with Senator Harkin, one of the most liberal members of the Senate, a Democrat. And he and I work together because of our concern for the rights of the disabled, so there'd be a second look. And so 
It didn't happen. The federal judge and his exercise of his judicial discretion didn't choose to do a, a de novo review, but narrowly focused his ruling on the constitutional issues, and now we are where we are. But I, for one, having lived in tyranny at a point in my life, can tell you that one of the things that we must always share is just the independence of our judiciary. And as much as we might disagree with them, and as much as we need to review if there are issues that ever overstep their bounds of, of, of legality or what the judiciary is entitled or permitted to do, because we do have three co-equal branches of government, judicial, legislative, and executive. No judicial, no branch is uh, supreme over the others. Uh, I still believe in the independence of the judiciary. I still believe that the rule of law must prevail. And as we go through the next couple of days, when undoubtedly uh, this woman will expire, I think we need to just remember that we're a country of laws. And uh, the judicial process worked. Uh, some, and I particularly would disagree with some of the ways things went. But at the end of the day, we're a country of laws, and we have to observe the rule of law and move on. Fix our system if it needs repair. But most of all, there is no room or no place now for there to be a feeling that, that somehow or another we can take law into our hands because we didn't like the outcome that the judiciary gave us. I was wondering if maybe you followed what's been happening with Buddy Dyer and his election, rumors w with his election and his recent indictment, and if there's anything that you could say about that. And Only that it's a difficult time for the city of Orlando, that, uh, uh, but I believe we have a great city, and I think it would come through it and uh, that I think uh, in short order we'll have uh, an election. Um, one who is grateful to someone like Bill Frederick to step in on in an interim basis. Uh, but I think, uh, frankly, uh, beyond that, I don't have any comment. I think that uh, uh, Mayor Dyer is a good person, and I don't think that if there were any uh, misdeeds that they were of a nature that uh, would disqualify him from being a good mayor for the city of Orlando, while I politically may disagree with him on an issue or another, I think the process ought to go forward, and uh, it's in the hands of the courts again, and I think uh, it ought to go forward. In the meantime, uh, there's viable people that are willing to serve and run for mayor and, and serve on an interim basis until this issue is resolved. As far as the whole issue that, with the absentee ballots and that, that what he's being indicted for and everything, um, what, what do you have to say about that, like with people that are, are doing that in their campaigns? I mean, have you seen some of that in other people's campaigns? or? If, come across with that at all? Uh, not really, and I think it's a um, rare event, but if it happens, I mean, the statute changes at some point. Uh, no one has been ever prosecuted under that statute is an interesting fact. Uh, I don't think it's political either, but I think at the same time that uh, uh, I don't think that's one of the seminal problems of campaigns or voting uh, absentee fraud like it happened in Miami, which prompted the change in the statute. It's not what happened here, I don't believe. Uh, Senator Martinez, uh, you recently voted, along with uh, 50 other senators, to uh, fund drilling in the Anwar Refuge. Uh, although poll after poll shows that most Americans are opposed to this and would rather invest in renewable energy sources, um, there's a lot of talk in politics about pressure from oil companies and stuff. Did you feel any of that pressure personally, or was this a different decision you made? I felt absolutely no pressure in that regard at all. I felt a lot of pressure from the environmental community who did a great job of staying on me. I never once spoke with anyone with an oil company. Let me uh, tell you the basis for my decision. First of all, when I campaigned, I said I was going to vote for it. So there was never a change in my position. The voters of Florida had a chance to make another choice. They elected me. I'm not suggesting to you that the only reason they elected me was so that I would make that vote. And I know there's a lot of people with a lot of thoughts on how that should have gone. But I also sit on the Energy Committee. And when you look at the energy needs of our nation, and when you look at the possibilities for conservation, alternative sources of energy, all of which I support strongly, and I believe we've got to do it, let me just tell you that there is no refuge beyond the fact that, that we have got to look at alternative areas uh, for production. Uh, the United States is terribly dependent on foreign sources of oil. The Energy Committee, uh, we had testimony about the future prospects of energy. At this point in history, China consumes about a third of the oil we consume. We're the number one consumer of oil in the world. China consumes about a third of what we consume. Over the next 10 years, China will consume as much as we do. There's going to be a competition for that. And I promise you that as much as we might conserve, as much as we might use alternative sources of fuel, unless there's some incredible breakthrough, which I would love to fund the research to, to help happen, and I will do that. And, and, and will encourage uh, 
alternative uh, sources of, of energy for vehicles and things like that, that when China is going to consume that much of the world oil supply, we are heading for a real, real serious crisis. Today's outrageous gas prices are not going to seem that bad as we look to the future. Over 12 percent of our consumption comes from Venezuela. And if you want to look at the situation there, it isn't pretty. I lived through a communist dictator named Castro, and this guy is a Castro mini-me. And I promise you that he is looking to create the same kind of environment there. He hates America. He makes speeches about it. He's looking to other places in the world where he might sell his oil. Uh, if we were to lose that 12 percent of the supply, uh, it would be catastrophic. Now, having said all that, and I believe it was uh, the right vote to take, I campaigned saying that I would, and I did it. Uh, I am also very, very staunchly opposed to any drilling off Florida's coast. And I work very diligently with the White House to extend the moratoria and to extend the area of the moratoria. Uh, you know, it's been poorly understood by some who don't want to understand, but the bottom line is I did what I could. Given the fact that I was already going to vote for it anyway to get what I could for Florida, the fact of the matter is that I uh, believe we've made Florida more secure from drilling 100 miles offshore in an area where particularly there wasn't a clear-cut moratoria, but now that has been extended to that area as well. We're not through with that. I'm going to file a bill to try to extend uh, the offshore ban throughout the state of Florida 100 miles out indefinitely into the future. And so I hope that we can get that passed. In addition to that, there's some leases that we should buy back because some of them are very close to the shore, so in the Gulf. And so I think that uh, the difference is, and the inconsistency in my position, has to do with the fact that the entire legislative delegation from Alaska and the people of Alaska were staunchly in support of the drilling. They know their area best, you see. And just like we know we don't want drilling off our beaches for the reasons we all know, they know that where this is taking place and the way it's taking place is not going to do the kind of harm to the environment that is being suggested that it will do. This is their, their land. This is their place. They love it like we love our Florida. And they say, we can do this, and it would be a good thing for our communities and for our, for our state. So anyway, that was another difficult vote. Uh, I've only been there, by the way, uh, going on three months, and I'm tired. It's been a tough few months. Uh, but I'm looking forward to the future. It's been a very exciting time, and knowing that you're the last question, let me just say that I'm... Uh, I'm thrilled beyond belief to be your senator. I'm humbled by the responsibilities, and I intend to, uh, to make you uh, the best senator Florida's ever had. Thank you. Thank you.